Section 28 of Select Sermons of Jonathan Edwards. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Select Sermons of Jonathan Edwards. Section 28. The Justice of God in the Damnation of Sinners. Part 3. But I expect there are many of you that will object. Such an objection as this is probably now in the hearts of many here present. Objection. If I am not willing to have Christ for my Savior, I cannot make myself willing. But I would give an answer to this objection by laying down two things that must be acknowledged to be exceeding evident. 1. It is no excuse that you cannot receive Christ of yourself unless you would if you could. This is so evident of itself that it scarce needs any proof. Certainly, if persons would not if they could, it is just the same thing as to the blame that lies upon them, whether they can or cannot. If you were willing, and then found that you could not, you being unable would alter the case, and might be some excuse, because then the defect would not be in your will, but only in your ability. But as long as you will not, it is no matter whether you have ability or no ability. If you are not willing to accept of Christ, it follows that you have no sincere willingness to be willing, because the will always necessarily approves of and rests in its own acts. To suppose the contrary would be to suppose a contradiction. It would be to suppose that a man's will is contrary to itself, or that he wills contrary to what he himself wills. As you are not willing to come to Christ, and cannot make yourself willing, so you have no sincere desire to be willing, and therefore may most justly perish without a Saviour. There is no excuse at all for you, for say what you will about your inability, the seat of your blame lies in your perverse will, that is an enemy to the Saviour. It is in vain for you to tell of your want of power, as long as your will is found defective. If a man should hate you and smite you in the face, but should tell you at the same time that he hated you so much that he could not help choosing and willing so to do, would you take it the more patiently for that? Would not your indignation be rather stirred up the more? 2. If you would be willing if you could, that is no excuse, unless your unwillingness to be willing be sincere. That which is hypocritical, and does not come from the heart but is merely forced, ought wholly to be set aside, as worthy of no consideration, because common sense teaches that what is not hardy but hypocritical is indeed nothing, only a show of what is not. But that which is good for nothing ought to go for nothing. But if you set aside all that is not free, and call nothing a willingness but a free hardy willingness, then see how the case stands, and whether or no you have not lost all your excuse for standing out against the calls of the gospel. You say you would make yourself willing to accept if you could, but it is not from any good principle that you are willing for that. It is not from any free inclination, or true respect to Christ, or any love to your duty, or any spirit of obedience. It is not from the influence of any real respect, or tendency in your heart, towards anything good, or from any other principle than such as is in the hearts of devils, and would make them have the same sort of willingness in the same circumstances. It is therefore evident that there can be no goodness in that would be willing to come to Christ, and that which has no goodness cannot be an excuse for any badness. If there be no good in it, then it signifies nothing and weighs nothing when put into the scales to counterbalance that which is bad. Sinners therefore spend their time in foolish arguing and objecting, making much of that which is good for nothing, making those excuses that are not worth offering. It is in vain to keep making objection. You stand justly condemned. The blame lies at your door. Thrust it off from you as often as you will, it will return upon you. So fig leaves as long as you will, your nakedness will appear. You continue willfully and wickedly rejecting Jesus Christ, and will not have him for your Saviour, and therefore it is sottish madness in you to charge Christ with injustice that he does not save you. Here is the sin of unbelief. 
thus the guilt of that great sin lies upon you. If you never had thus treated a Saviour, you might most justly have been damned to all eternity. It would but be exactly agreeable to your treatment of God. But besides this, when God, notwithstanding, has offered you his own dear Son, to save you from this endless misery you had deserved, and not only so, but to make you happy eternally in the enjoyment of himself, you have refused him, and would not have him for your Saviour, and still refuse to comply with the offers of the gospel. What can render any person more inexcusable? If you should now perish for ever, what can you have to say? Hereby the justice of God in your destruction appears in two respects. 1. It is more abundantly manifest that it is just that you should be destroyed. Justice never appears so conspicuous as it does after refused and abused mercy. Justice in damnation appears abundantly the more clear and bright after a willful rejection of offered salvation. What can an offended prince do more than freely offer pardon to a condemned malefactor? And if he refuses to accept of it, will any one say that his execution is unjust? 2. God's justice will appear in your greater destruction. Besides the guilt that you would have had if a Savior had never been offered, you bring that great additional guilt upon you of most ungratefully refusing offered deliverance. What more base and vile treatment of God can there be than for you, when justly condemned to eternal misery, and ready to be executed, and God graciously sends his own Son, who comes and knocks at your door with a pardon in his hand, and not only a pardon, but a deed of eternal glory? I say, what can be worse, than for you, out of dislike and enmity against God and his Son, to refuse to accept those benefits at his hands. How justly may the anger of God be greatly incensed and increased by it! When a sinner thus ungratefully rejects mercy, his last error is worse than the first. It is more heinous than all his former rebellion, and may justly bring down more fearful wrath upon him. The heinousness of this sin of rejecting a Saviour especially appears in two things. 1. The greatness of the benefits offered, which appears in the greatness of the deliverance, which is from inexpressible degrees of corruption and wickedness of heart and life, the least degree of which is infinitely evil, and from misery that is everlasting, and in the greatness and glory of the inheritance purchased and offered. Hebrews 2 verse 3 how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? 2. The wonderfulness of the way in which these benefits are procured and offered. That God should lay help on his own son, when our case was so deplorable that help could be had in no mere creature. And that he should undertake for us, and should come into the world, and take upon him our nature, and should not only appear in a low state of life, but should die such a death and endure such torments and contempt for sinners while enemies, how wonderful is it! And what tongue or pen can set forth the greatness of the ingratitude, baseness, and perverseness there is in it, when a perishing sinner that is in the most extreme necessity of salvation rejects it after it is procured in such a way as this? That so glorious a person should be thus treated, and that when he comes on so gracious an errand, that he should stand so long offering himself and calling and inviting, as he has done to many of you, and all to no purpose, but all the while be set at naught. Surely you might justly be cast into hell without one more offer of a Saviour, yea, and thrust down into the lowest hell. Herein you have exceeded the very devils, for they never rejected the offers of such glorious mercy, no, nor of any mercy at all. This will be a distinguishing condemnation of gospel sinners, John 3.18. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That outward smoothness of your carriage towards Christ, that appearance of respect to him in your looks, your speeches and gestures, do not argue but that you set him at naught in your heart. There may be much of these outward shows of respect, and yet you be like Judas, that betrayed the Son of Man with a kiss, and like those mockers that bowed the knee before him, and at the same time spit in his face. 
3. If God should forever cast you off and destroy you, it would be agreeable to your treatment of others. It would be no other than what would be exactly answerable to your behavior towards your fellow creatures, that have the same human nature, and are naturally in the same circumstances with you, and that you ought to love as yourself. And that appears especially in two things. 1. You have many of you been opposite in your spirit to the salvation of others. There are several ways that natural men manifest a spirit of opposition against the salvation of souls. It sometimes appears by a fear that their companions, acquaintances, and equals will obtain mercy, and so become unspeakably happier than they. It is sometimes manifested by an uneasiness at the news of what others have hopefully obtained. It appears when persons envy others for it, and dislike them the more, and disrelish their talk, and avoid their company, and cannot bear to hear their religious discourse, and especially to receive warnings and counsels from them. And it oftentimes appears by their backwardness to entertain charitable thoughts of them, and by their being brought with difficulty to believe that they have obtained mercy, and a forwardness to listen to anything that seems to contradict it. The devil hated to own Job's sincerity, Job 1, 7, etc., and chapter 2, verses 3, 4, and 5. There appears very often much of this spirit of the devil in natural men. Sometimes they are ready to make a ridicule of others' pretended godliness. They speak of the ground of others' hopes, as the enemies of the Jews did of the wall that they built, Nehemiah 4, 3. Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. There are many that join with Sanballat and Tobiah, and are of the same spirit with them. There always was, and always will be, an enmity betwixt the seed of the serpent and the seed of the women. It appeared in Cain, who hated his brother, because he was more acceptable to God than himself. And it appears still in these times, and in this place. There are many that are like the elder brother, who could not bear that the prodigal, when he returned, should be received with joy and good entertainment, and was put into a fret by it, both against his brother that had returned, and his father that had made him so welcome. Luke 15. Thus have many of you been opposite to the salvation of others, who stand in as great necessity of it as you. You have been against their being delivered from everlasting misery, who can bear it no better than you, not because their salvation would do you any hurt, or their damnation help you, any otherwise than as it would gratify that vile spirit that is so much like the spirit of the devil, who, because he is miserable himself, is unwilling that others should be happy. How just, therefore, is it that God should be opposite to your salvation? If you have so little love or mercy in you as to begrudge your neighbor's salvation, whom you have no cause to hate, but the law of God in nature requires you to love, why is God bound to exercise such infinite love and mercy to you, as to save you at the price of his own blood? You, whom he is no way bound to love, but who have deserved his hatred a thousand and a thousand times. You are not willing that others should be converted, who have behaved themselves injuriously towards you. And yet, will you count it hard if God does not bestow converting grace upon you, that have deserved ten thousand times as ill of God, as ever any of your neighbors have of you? You are opposite to God's showing mercy to those that you think have been vicious persons, and are very unworthy of such mercy. Is others' unworthiness a just reason why God should not bestow mercy on them? And yet will God be hard, if, notwithstanding all your unworthiness, and the abominableness of your spirit and practice in his sight, he does not show you mercy. You would have God bestow liberally on you, and upbraid not, but yet when he shows mercy to others, you are ready to upbraid as soon as you hear of it. You immediately are thinking with yourself how ill they have behaved themselves, and it may be your mouths on this occasion are open, enumerating and aggravating the sins they have been guilty of. You would have God bury all your faults, and wholly blot out all your transgressions, but if he bestows mercy on others, it may be you will take that occasion to rake up all their old faults that you can think of. 
you do not much reflect on and condemn yourself for your baseness and unjust spirit towards others, in your opposition to their salvation. You do not quarrel with yourself and condemn yourself for this, but yet you in your heart will quarrel with God and fret at his dispensations, because you think he seems opposite to showing mercy to you. One would think that the consideration of these things should forever stop your mouth. 2. Consider how you have promoted others' damnation. Many of you, by the bad examples you have set, by corrupting the minds of others by your sinful conversation, by leading them into or strengthening them in sin, and by the mischief you have done in human society other ways that might be mentioned, have been guilty of those things that have tended to others' damnation. You have heretofore appeared on the side of sin and Satan, and have strengthened their interest, and have been many ways accessory to others' sins, have hardened their hearts, and thereby have done what was tended to the ruin of their souls. Without doubt there are those here present who have been in a great measure the means of others' damnation. One man may really be a means of others' damnation as well as salvation. Christ charges the scribes and Pharisees with this, Matthew 23, verse 13, Ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. We have no reason to think that this congregation has none in it who are cursed from day to day by poor souls that are roaring out in hell, whose damnation they have been the means of, or have greatly contributed to. There are many who contribute to their own children's damnation by neglecting their education, by setting them bad examples, and bringing them up in sinful ways. They take some care of their bodies, but take little care of their poor souls, they provide for them bread to eat, but deny them the bread of life that their famishing souls stand in need of. And are there no such parents here who have thus treated their children? If their children be not gone to hell, no thanks to them. It is not because they have not done what was tended to their destruction. Seeing, therefore, you have had no more regard to others' salvation, and have promoted their damnation, how justly might God leave you to perish yourself. 4. If God should eternally cast you off, it would be agreeable to your own behavior towards yourself, and that in two respects. 1. In being so careless of your own salvation. You have refused to take care of your salvation, as God has counseled and commanded you from time to time. And why may God not neglect it, now you seek it of Him? Is God obliged to be more careful of your happiness, then you are either of your own happiness or his glory? Is God bound to take that care for you, out of love to you, that you will not take for yourself, either from love to yourself or regard to his authority? How long and how greatly have you neglected the welfare of your precious soul, refusing to take pains and deny yourself, or put yourself a little out of your way for your salvation, while God has been calling upon you? Neither your duty to God, nor your love to your own soul, were enough to induce you to do little things for your own eternal welfare. And yet do you now expect that God should do great things, putting forth almighty power, and exercising infinite mercy for it? You was urged to take care of your salvation, and not to put it off. You was told that was the best time before you grew older, and that it might be, if you would put it off, God would not hear you afterwards. But yet you would not hearken. You would run the venture of it. Now how justly might God order it so, that it should be too late, leaving you to seek in vain. You was told that you would repent of it if you delayed. But you would not hear. How justly, therefore, may God give you cause to repent of it, by refusing to show you mercy now. If God sees you going on in ways contrary to his commands and his glory, and requires you to forsake them, and tells you that they tend to the destruction of your own soul, and therefore counsels you to avoid them, and you refuse, how just would it be if God should be provoked by it, henceforward to be as careless of the good of your soul as you are yourself? 2. You have not only neglected your salvation, but you have willingly taken direct courses to undo yourself. 
you have gone on in those ways and practices which have directly tended to your damnation, and have been perverse and obstinate in it. You cannot plead ignorance. You had all the light set before you that you could desire. God told you that you was undoing yourself, but yet you would do it. He told you that the path you was going in led to destruction, and counseled you to avoid it, but you would not hearken. How justly, therefore, may God leave you to be undone. You have obstinately persisted to travel in the way that leads to hell for a long time, contrary to God's continual counsels and commands, till it may be at length you are got almost to your journey's end, and are come near to hell's gate, and so begin to be sensible of your danger and misery, and now account it unjust and hard if God will not deliver you. You have destroyed yourself, and destroyed yourself willfully, contrary to God's repeated counsels, yea, and destroyed yourself on fighting against God. Now, therefore, why do you blame any but yourself if you are destroyed? If you will undo yourself in opposing God, and while God opposes you by his calls and counsels, and, it may be too, by the convictions of his Spirit, what can you object against it, if God now leaves you to be undone? You would have your own way, and did not like that God should oppose you in it, and your way was to ruin your own soul. How just, therefore, is it, if, now at length, God ceases to oppose you, and falls in with you, and lets your soul be ruined, and as you would destroy yourself, so should put to his hand to destroy you too. The ways you went on in had a natural tendency to your misery. If you would drink poison in opposition to God, and in contempt of him and his advice, who can you blame but yourself if you are poisoned, and so perish? If you would run into the fire against all restraints both of God's mercy and authority, you must even blame yourself if you are burnt. Thus I have proposed some things to your consideration, which, if you are not exceeding blind, senseless, and perverse, will stop your mouth, and convince you that you stand justly condemned before God, and that he would in no wise deal hardly with you, but altogether justly, in denying you any mercy, and in refusing to hear your prayers, though you pray never so earnestly, and never so often, and continue in it never so long. God may utterly disregard your tears and moans, your heavy heart, your earnest desires, and great endeavors, and he may cast you into eternal destruction, without any regard to your welfare, denying you converting grace, and giving you over to Satan, and at last cast you into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, to be there to eternity, having no rest day or night, forever glorifying his justice upon you in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Objection. But here many may still object, for I am sensible it is a hard thing to stop sinners' mouths. God shows mercy to others that have done these things as well as I, yea, that have done a great deal worse than I. Answer. 1. That does not prove that God is any way bound to show mercy to you or them either. If God bestows it on others, he does not so because he is bound to bestow it. He might, if he had pleased, with glorious justice, have denied it them. If God bestows it on some, that does not prove that he is bound to bestow it on any. And if he is bound to bestow it on none, then he is not bound to bestow it on you. God is in debt to none and if he gives to some that he is not in debt to, because it is his pleasure, that does not bring him into debt to others. It alters not the case as to you whether others have it or have it not. You do not deserve damnation the less than if mercy never had been bestowed on any at all. Matthew 20, verse 15. Is thine eye evil because mine is good? 2. If this objection be good, then the exercise of God's mercy is not in his own right, and his grace is not his own to give. That which God may not dispose of as he pleases is not his own, for that which is one's own is at one's own disposal. But if it be not God's own, then he is not capable of making a gift or present of it to any one. It is impossible to give what is a debt. What is it that you would make of God? Must the great God be tied up, 
that he must not use his own pleasure in bestowing his own gifts, but if he bestows them on one, must be looked upon obliged to bestow them on another? Is not God worthy to have the same right with respect to the gifts of his grace that a man has to his money or goods? Is it because God is not so great, and should be more in subjection than man, that this cannot be allowed him? If any of you see cause to show kindness to a neighbor, do all the rest of your neighbors come to you and tell you that you owe them so much as you have given to such a man? But this is the way that you deal with God, as though God were not worthy to have as absolute a property in his goods as you have in yours. At this rate God cannot make a present of anything. He has nothing of his own to bestow. If he has a mind to show peculiar favor to some, or to lay some particular persons under peculiar obligations to him, he cannot do it, because he has no special gift at his own disposal. If this be the case, why do you pray to God to bestow saving grace upon you? If God does not do fairly to deny it you, because he bestows it on others, then it is not worth your while to pray for it, but you may go and tell him that he has bestowed it on others as bad or worse than you, and so demand it of him as a debt. And at this rate persons never need to thank God for salvation when it is bestowed. For what occasion is there to thank God for that which was not at his own disposal, and that he could not fairly have denied? The thing at bottom is, that men have low thoughts of God and high thoughts of themselves, and therefore it is that they look upon God as having so little right, and they so much. Matthew 20, verse 15. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? 3. God may justly show greater respect to others than to you, for you have shown greater respect to others than to God. You have rather chosen to offend God than men. God only shows a greater respect to others, who are by nature your equals, than to you. But you have shown a greater respect to those that are infinitely inferior to God than to him. You have shown a greater regard to wicked men than to God. You have honored them more, loved them better, and adhered to them rather than to him. Yea, you have honored the devil in many respects more than God. You have chosen his will and his interest, rather than God's will and his glory. You have chosen a little worldly pelf rather than God. You have set more by a vile lust than by him. You have chosen these things and rejected God. You have set your heart on these things and cast God behind your back. And where is the injustice if God is pleased to show greater respect to others than to you, or if he chooses others and rejects you? You have shown greater respect to vile and worthless things, and no respect to God's glory. And why may not God set his love on others, and have no respect to your happiness? You have shown great respect to others, and not to God, whom you are laid under infinite obligations to respect above all. And why may not God show respect to others, and not to you, who never have laid him under the least obligation? And will you not be ashamed, notwithstanding all these things, still to open your mouth, to object and cavil about the decrees of God, and other things that you cannot fully understand? Let the decrees of God be what they will, that alters not the case as to your liberty, any more than if God had only foreknown. And why is God to blame for decreeing things, especially since he decrees nothing but good? How unbecoming an infinitely wise being would it have been to have made a world and let things run at random without disposing events or foreordering how they should come to pass? And what is that to you, how God has foreordered things, as long as your constant experience teaches you that it does not hinder your doing what you choose to do? This you know, and your daily practice and behavior amongst men declares that you are fully sensible of it with respect to yourself and others. Still to object, because there are some things in God's dispensation above your understanding, is exceedingly unreasonable. Your own conscience charges you with great guilt, and with those things that have been mentioned, let the secret things of God be what they will. Your conscience charges you with those vile dispositions, and that base behavior towards God, 
that you would at any time most highly resent in your neighbor towards you, and that not a whit the less for any concern those secret counsels and mysterious dispensations of God may have in the matter. It is in vain for you to exalt yourself against an infinitely great and holy and just God. If you continue in it, it will be to your eternal shame and confusion, when hereafter you shall see at whose door all the blame of your misery lies. I will finish what I have to say to natural men in the application of this doctrine, with a caution not to improve the doctrine to discouragement. For though it would be righteous in God for ever to cast you off and destroy you, yet it would also be just in God to save you, in and through Christ, who has made complete satisfaction for all sin. Romans 3, verse 25 and 26, quote, Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation, through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. End quote. Yea, God may, through this mediator, not only justly, but honorably, show you mercy. The blood of Christ is so precious that it is fully sufficient to pay the debt you have contracted, and perfectly to vindicate the divine majesty from all the dishonor cast upon it by these many great sins of yours that have been mentioned. It was as great, and indeed a much greater thing, for Christ to die than it would have been for you and all mankind to have burnt in hell to all eternity. Of such dignity and excellency is Christ in the eyes of God, that, seeing he has suffered so much for poor sinners, God is willing to be at peace with them, however vile and unworthy they have been, and on how many accounts soever the punishment would be just. So that you need not be at all discouraged from seeking mercy, for there is enough in Christ. Indeed, it would not become the glory of God's majesty to show mercy to you, so sinful and vile a creature, for anything that you have done, for such worthless and despicable things as your prayers and other religious performances. It would be very dishonorable and unworthy of God so to do, and it is vain to expect it. He will show mercy only on Christ's account, and that, according to his sovereign pleasure, on whom he pleases, when he pleases, and in what manner he pleases. You cannot bring him under obligation by your works. Do what you will, he will not look on himself obliged. But if it be his pleasure, he can honorably show mercy through Christ to any sinner of you all, not one in this congregation excepted. Therefore there is encouragement for you still to seek and wait, notwithstanding all your wickedness, agreeable to Samuel's speech to the children of Israel, when they were terrified with the thunder and rain that God sent, and when guilt stared them in the face. 1 Samuel 12, verse 20. Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. I would conclude this discourse by putting the godly in mind of the freeness and wonderfulness of the grace of God towards them for such were the same of you. The case was just so with you as you have heard. You had such a wicked heart, you lived such a wicked life, and it would have been most just with God for ever to have cast you off. But he has had mercy upon you. He hath made his glorious grace appear in your everlasting salvation. You had no love to God, but yet he has exercised unspeakable love to you. You have contemned God, and set light by him, but so great a value has God's grace set on you and your happiness that you have been redeemed at the price of the blood of his own Son. You chose to be with Satan in his service, but yet God hath made you a joint heir with Christ of his glory. You was ungrateful for past mercies, yet God not only continued those mercies, but bestowed unspeakably greater mercies upon you. You refused to hear when God called, yet God heard you when you called. You abused the infiniteness of God's mercy to encourage yourself in sin against him. Yet God has manifested the infiniteness of that mercy in the exercises of it towards you. You have rejected Christ and set him at naught, and yet he is become your Savior. You have neglected your own salvation, 
but God has not neglected it. You have destroyed yourself, but yet in God has been your help. God has magnified his free grace towards you and not to others, because he has chosen you, and it hath pleased him to set his love upon you. Oh, what cause is here for praise! What obligations you are under to bless the Lord who hath dealt bountifully with you, and magnify his holy name! What cause for you to praise God in humility, to walk humbly before him! Ezekiel 16, verse 63, that thou mayest remember and be confounded, and never open thy mouth any more, because of thy shame, when I am pacified toward thee for all that thou hast done, saith the Lord God. You shall never open your mouth in boasting or self-justification, but lie the lower before God for his mercy to you. You have reason, the more abundantly, to open your mouth in God's praises, that they may be continually in your mouth, both here and to all eternity, for his rich, unspeakable, and sovereign mercy to you, whereby he, and he alone, hath made you to differ from others. End of section 28